the banks have paid fines larger than the market cap of Bitcoin for fraud, money laundering, all kinds of bad stuff, like cheating Darren out of money that he you know, borrowed from Mark because they're unscrupulous. And not all of them, but, but many of them. And now with triple entry accounting, with blockchain, with a ledger that is permanent, immutable, and not corruptible, we solve that. So the banks are freaking out. They're like, no, no, no. We skim $7 trillion a year out of this system. It's 6 to 8% of global GDP goes to the banks for trust, but we can replace trust with truth. Morgan Creek Capital Management founder and chief executive officer Mark Yusko has been warning about the relentless efforts of the traditional financial industry to get rid of the cryptocurrency industry for a while now. Last November, after the collapse of SBF, FTX, and Alameda Research, Yusko repeatedly stated that the collapse was specially orchestrated to bring some controversy to the crypto industry and give U.S. regulators free reign to launch its aggressive onslaught against the industry. Yusko has repeatedly described how a famous U.S. investor pulled out of an investment agreement regarding digital asset lender BlockFi at the very last minute in 2022. According to Yusko, most of the crypto-related firms that went belly up during the widespread contagion that made millions of investors wary of the budding cryptocurrency industry were a result of the banking sector's continued interference. The hedge fund manager believes the centuries-old industry is in cahoots with U.S. regulators to permanently cripple the cryptocurrency industry so their absolute control of the world's wealth can remain unchallenged. Yusko has asserted that in return, U.S. politicians and regulators get more money to fund their ambitions. An example is Sam Bankman-Fried's multi-million dollar political donations to both Democratic and Republican politicians before his arrest. There is an endgame to all of this Yusko believes, an endgame that would satisfy the insatiable desires of the traditional banking sector and give politicians and regulators adequate control over how people's finances and investments. According to Yusko, this endgame will be fully operational before 2027, which is when he expects the ongoing onslaught on the cryptocurrency industry to completely tire itself out and give way to grudging acceptance and respect. We are in the then they fight you phase and it's about to get very intense because several antecedents show that the top guys in the banking industry will do anything to hold on to control power and the seven trillion dollars they are able to skim off annually. We will now bring you clips from one of Mark Yosko's recent interviews as he discusses the mode of operation of older industries to try and get rid of new, better entrants. This is a fascinating discussion you don't want to miss. So watch the video to the end, smash the like button and subscribe to the channel so you never miss any of our subsequent uploads. Also, make sure you drop your comments and observations in the comments section below. Everything you do helps with the YouTube algorithm and contributes to the channel's growth. Thanks and enjoy the video. I used to tell the story about the Medici's. The Medici's invented fractional reserve banking, but they didn't actually. And I always said they borrowed, stole, right? Picasso said good artists borrow, great artists steal. Um, and they borrowed this idea for, from some monks. And I didn't actually know who the monks were until I went this summer on a trip to, to Spain and Portugal. And I learned that the monks that the Medici's borrowed from were the Knights Templar, the Order of Christ, the monks in Portugal. And they invented fractional reserve banking because what they did is they would hold the gold for all the knights that would go out on these missions and, you know, they'd discover the Americas or they'd discover India and they'd get, you know, funding from, from all the kings and queens and the original venture capitalists. You know, they would take 20% of the carried interest, 20% of what came back from the, the new world. And these knights, basically, some of them didn't come back because it was kind of a rough time back then. And so the other knights were like, well, what do you do with all this gold? Hey, I got an idea. Let's lend it ourselves to other people and, and fund some of these things. And so we can keep some profit and we'll charge interest. That was the creation of fractional reserve banking. So the Medici's did the same thing. And look, in the old days, if I lent you money, right? I wrote down in my ledger, Darren owes me 100 bucks. Now you come back a year later to pay me 110 with interest, but I'm an unscrupulous guy and I've changed my ledger and it says 200. And you're like, no, I only borrowed 100. I'm like, right here, this is the, this is the truth because you had to trust me and I'm not a trustworthy guy. So the Medici's came along and said, no, that's a bad system. Darren, you keep a ledger. Mark, you keep a ledger. And we, the benevolent Medici's, for a small fee, 
will decide that the ledgers match. But here's the problem. I'm an unscrupulous guy. I go to the Medici's. I'm like, I'm going to change my number to 200. I'll give you half. You get 50. I get 150. Darren loses. Okay. So you come back, pay me the 100. I say 200. And you're like, hey, Medici's, it says 100. Darren, you must have written the number down wrong. I don't, I don't know. You, you just must have, you must have blown it. Well, so we had this system based on trust with a bunch of untrustworthy people, but we can replace trust with truth. We now have a ledger that gives us truth. You wrote down 100, I wrote down 100, and the third ledger says it's 100. And no matter what I say or what you say, the ledger says it's 100. No one loses. We all win. And we take that $7 trillion of frictional costs and we can liberate it okay, and get more creativity, more productivity. And uh, the future is very bright, but we got to get through this transition where the banks are clutching to keep control of this antiquated system that, that needs to go. Older industries, especially ones as rife with corruption as the banking sector, will do anything to tenaciously cling to power. It was the same thing the horse and buggy industry did to prevent the spread of automobiles in the late 19th century. They reportedly colluded with regulators to enforce strict and ridiculous traffic laws. An example is the red flag traffic laws that mandated drivers of early automobiles to take certain safety precautions, including having a pedestrian wave a red flag or carry a lantern to warn bystanders of the vehicle's approach. The United Kingdom's Locomotives Act 1865 or the Red Flag Act stated, Firstly, at least three persons shall be employed to drive or conduct such locomotive, and if more than two wagons or carriages he attached thereto, an additional person shall be employed, who shall take charge of such wagons or carriages. Secondly, one of such persons, while any locomotive is in motion, shall precede such locomotive on foot by not less than 60 yards, and shall carry a red flag constantly displayed, and shall warn the riders and drivers of horses of the approach of such locomotives, and shall signal the driver thereof when it shall be necessary to stop, and shall assist horses and carriages drawn by horses, passing the same. The laws were enforced for over 30 years before they were repealed in 1896, when the older industry finally accepted defeat. Here is Mark Yusko with another example of corrupt collusion with regulators to stifle out a less powerful sector. I grew up um, as the, the son of a cable entrepreneur. So my dad was, was early on in, in cable TV. And um, he ran a, a small system in, in Washington State where we lived and uh, then up, um, bought some systems down in Texas where we moved to. Long story short, um, there's this guy, John Malone. And John said, you know, he was like J.P. Morgan in the old days. J.P. Morgan was famously quoted saying, I like a little competition. So what J.P. Morgan did to the Knickerbocker Trust is legendary and, and made them go away. John Malone did the same thing. He paid a little something, something to people in Congress and got them to pass the Cable Re-Regulation Act. And basically what it did is it mandated, made it a law that you had to have two-way addressable systems. Well, that's very expensive, right? Cable is supposed to go one way, it's supposed to go from the, the hub into people's homes, but now it had to go two ways because we we're entering you know, the digital age. And all these mom and pop shops like my dad could not afford to do that. So this law got passed, the price of systems plummeted. They all went out of business. All, everyone went bankrupt. John Malone went and bought them all and created the largest cable company in the world. And then magically, this is great, magically, the law got repealed and he didn't have to make them addressable. It was crazy. I mean, it's funny how that just happens. And so banking is, is trying to do the same thing. Is laws like, you know, rules like Basel IV are designed to intentionally con, you know, concentrate the money at the tippy top of the pyramid. And then I believe they will decree that everybody has to use the CBDC. And look, if that doesn't terrify people, then you're just not paying attention. And if you haven't watched Augustine, whatever his last name is, uh, the Carson. head of the BIS, Carstens, talk about what a CBDC actually is. And that, of course, the central bank should control how, when, and if 
you're allowed to spend your money. It's one of the most chilling minute and 47 seconds you'll ever watch. The U.S. banking industry is not without its own problems, shows recent reports from Fitch Ratings, one of three major credit rating agencies. According to a Fitch analyst, the U.S. banking industry is closer to another round of turbulence and takeovers. The agency cut its assessment of the industry's health in June, a move Chris Wolf, the Fitch analyst, said went largely unnoticed because it didn't trigger downgrades on banks. Wolf warns that another one-notch downgrade of the industry's score of 2A+, from AA negative, would force the agency to reevaluate ratings on each of the over 70 U.S. banks it covers, which include J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, and Goldman Sachs. During a recent exclusive interview with CNBC, Wolf said, If we were to move it to a plus, then that would recalibrate all our financial measures and would probably translate into negative rating actions. Another downgrade of the industry to A plus would mean that the industry's score would be lower than some of its top-rated institutions like J.P. Morgan and Bank of America, which have an AA negative rating. Banks cannot be rated higher than the industry in which they operate. As such, the bank's ratings will have to drop lower too, and so will the rating of other banks covered by Fitch. According to Wolf, this might lower investors' confidence in the industry, which might already be on the brink of another crisis. What are your thoughts on Mark Yusko's interview? Please drop your comments in the comments section below. Also, ensure you subscribe to the channel, turn on post notifications, and check out our other videos on cryptocurrencies and the overall digital assets industry. Thanks for watching.